Hey everyone, welcome to this panel. Uh, very happy to have you all here. My name is Jonathan Grecian. I'm a co-founder of the Founder Institute and we have a really great international and varied panel here today to talk about something that's uh, always been important and is even more important now in the, in this age of COVID and, and, and in the post-COVID world. Um, I do see we, we have some people that are starting to join now in the chat. So uh, welcome to Avi, welcome to Michelle. Um, anyone else in here, please know that I wanna make this, this panel as interactive as possible, okay? So if at any time you have any questions, please throw them into the chat and I'm gonna try to pepper them into the conversation because honestly, you know, I, I run a lot of these online events. You, know, you can go to YouTube to watch a video of people speaking, right? Like, let's try to make this as, as interactive as possible. And we, and we have a, a very international and varied uh, audience of speakers here today. So you should be able to get some really interesting perspective. So please don't be shy, uh, throw any, any questions that you have into the chat and, and I'll be sure to, to pepper them in. All right, so uh, we're going to be talking today about these cluster hubs, okay? And and I am personally, I'm, I'm based in uh, in the United States. I live in Colorado now, currently in California. My business is based in Silicon Valley. But you know, building these cluster hubs, these these hubs of innovation, startup communities, whatever you want to call them around the world, it's always been known and and kind of understood that having that physical interaction of people, of ideas, of cultures, of all this kind of stuff is usually what leads to the innovative ideas, whether it's at the university level or the commercial level or the corporate level or whatever. And that's all been thrown into a little bit of a, a tailspin uh, these last these last couple of months, but uh, it's not always uh, a bad thing. And um, I think there's been a lot of opportunities that have been created and that's why I'm really interested today to talk to uh, our panel where we have four different continents. We have Europe, uh, we have a representative from Moscow, Tokyo as well. I believe it's it's five in the morning there, 4.30 in the morning there. So thank you for joining from Tokyo. Um, and uh, joining from the future, might I add. And uh, and also uh, we have uh, you know representatives in Europe and, and Canada, myself in the US. So with that being said, I'm going to start going through the introductions to our esteemed panel members. And please, for the people that are watching, don't be shy. Throw your questions into the chat, and I'm going to try to incorporate them in as best as I can. So um, I think I'll start in uh, in Armenia as we as we start to go around the world to our different panelists. So, uh, Sashka, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, for sure. So thank you so much for having me on this panel. It's an honor to be able to have this conversation with all of you. So my name is Sashka. I'm a social entrepreneur and a filmmaker. I run a social startup in northern Armenia in Balanzod called Creopia. Our goal is to ignite a creative economy in a rural area. And we want to prove this model here that can be replicated anywhere else in a rural area that suffers from the prob same problems of over-centralization in capital cities and creative brain drain. So this project has been going on for just over a year now. We've been working with our local communities um, in doing mostly skills education training for creative services and obviously working with clientele mostly in the English speaking market, US, uh, Canada, UK for our work in video editing and animation. So yeah, looking forward to getting into the cluster because specifically for me, the most thing, the most important kind of concept of social entrepreneurship and development is the idea of decentralization and cluster hubs, especially in rural areas are extremely important for moving that forward. Well, uh, nothing like a global pandemic to create some decentralization. Right? <laughs> um, all right. So next next on the, the list here of speakers, uh, we're going to fly uh, all the way over to, to Tokyo, as I had mentioned before. Hey, Pina, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me on this panel. Uh, I'm Pina Hirano, Hirano from Tokyo, founder and CEO of Astero Corporation, a business software company listed on Tokyo Stock Exchange. Of course, we are startup in the beginning and now we support startup committees in Tokyo and have frequent access to software startup cluster in Tokyo. So. I can talk about those kind of stuff in this panel. Thank you. Okay, great. That's that's awesome. And uh, the the next person I want to introduce here is uh, Christian. So we're going to fly back to to Germany. Uh, Christian, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, it's great, a great pleasure being on this panel. 
my in my chest there's two hearts one of a scientist and one of an entrepreneur uh, I started out as a virologist and then started my first company during my PhD and have been starting companies ever since and then during the last 15 years my focus was building world class local innovation ecosystems I was for eight years uh, the head of the biotechnology cluster in Heidelberg Germany which was one of the main uh, biomedical innovation hubs in Europe uh, managing an 80 million euro public private research and development fund and uh, since seven years i'm running my own uh, independent research center which is called biomedex institute and which is based on a new innovation model which via crowdsourcing identifies the best uh, early career research talent uh, at the world's best universities and research institutions and then relocates them with their families to heidelberg for research uh, projects academic and, and industry research projects uh, in heidelberg at my institute and in the last seven years and we have re relocated more than 150 families of top researchers from all around the world. Wow, that's that's a lot of relocation. Uh, <laughs> they must they they must be super talented people um, uh, that you're really relocating there. So that's great. And then last but not least, uh, I just want to introduce uh, Manfred. So coming over here to my neck of the woods in North America, Manfred, based out of Canada. You want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Yes, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you and uh, part of this panel here. Uh, my name is Manfred Zoik. I'm a Vice President for External Affairs and International Relations at the uh, Concordia University of Edmonton in uh, Edmonton, Alberta. Um, immigrant from Brazil to Canada and I bring a Brazilian perspective to this university where I'm working for eight years now in terms of you know, internationalization but also um, the industry connection. Uh, with the tech parks uh, that we have in Brazil. So Concordia is uh, uh, one of the six, six post-secondaries in Edmonton and will be 100 years old, one of the oldest in Alberta. And um, since 2012, uh, very heavily internationalized for our size. We are a small university, there are six post-secondaries. Uh, we have 3,300 students, uh, almost 100 years. And um, we created, uh, since 2016, three tech centers and a university like ours has hubs by nature, or we are creating hubs. The hubs are in research, but also in international cooperation, which I can talk a little bit uh, today, and the industry connection. So the three tech centers that we created since 2016 were a center for innovation and applied research, like a tech entrepreneur incubator center at Concordia. Um, the other is 2019, the center for applied artificial intelligence, uh, and we have a hub uh, I want to talk to you about today. And the last one, uh, but not least, uh, created in 2020, is a Center for Applied Renewable Energy. So these are um, uh, for Concordia, uh, because we were a faith-based Lutheran until mid-2015, uh, uh, and now we are secularized, we are um, public in outlook, but this tech component is very strong for our size. So. Sure. To okay, great. And uh, and just to wrap up on my, on my personal intro, so Jonathan Grechen, co-founder of the Founder Institute. I'm, I'm mostly from a, a marketing and product management background. We run pre-seed startup accelerators all around the world. Learn more about us at fi.co. But I want to start with you, uh, Manfred, really quick. Just, you know, you, you uh, immediately there as a university, right, you're cr trying to create these these different hubs around, you know, so you said AI and, and a couple other key technologies that obviously your, your university sees as being integral to the future. I, I would imagine that pre-COVID, uh, those hubs were seen, you know, was was it facilities and, and things like this? How, how is the university, how are, are you guys at the university level already adapting to this new world that we're in? Totally, good question. Uh, Concordia, when in March, when we decided to not go to campus anymore, uh, Concordia adapted, um, not many were, were doing this, adapted from night to day. The next day we, we taught online. So we didn't have any time needed for that. Uh, the, the professors jumped on and since then there was a huge growth in, uh, in, in skills and technology. These hubs, we have a, we have a physical space uh, and we are building as we speak uh, trying, uh, yet a new, another new building uh, coming up here. Uh, but what happens is that, for instance, we had a first innovation launch pad with the students and uh, here in Alberta, at Concordia, and this was in person on campus. 
with the showcase of the launchpad in June, this was all online. So the students presented, 11 students presented their new businesses. Uh, and we had the judges, everything was, was done online. We had $23,000 in, in awards uh, being given. So there is really, um, uh, there is really a um, jump in these, in these months on, adapti on adapting to the reality of, you know, in the, in even the international hubs. Um, let me say, uh, we, we are working now in AI, we will start working with Erlangen University and Barcelona and, uh, and you know, in Brazil and, and Bielefeld and so forth. I think we are expanding faster than <laughs> pre-COVID. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense because and, and I'll, I'll bring this just really quick to, to Sashka as well. Right. Because you it just stuck in my head the word that you use, the decentralization. Right. Um, with it in this in this new virtual world, it, it's you know, we can look at it as a negative or we can look at it as positive. Uh, you can create so many more global connections. I mean, what is a, a region like yours? What, what are some of the things that you've been seeing to, to take advantage of, of that opportunity? Yeah, um, I love that you brought this up because the whole idea of decentralization that kind of started the concept for Creopia, when the pandemic hit, it really turned into an understanding of of the fact that a decentralized world is actually a more connected world, right? Because you can't decentralize without extensive connections to other networks around you. And so what we've realized over this time, and especially something that has shifted very clearly within our clientele, is that, you know, people have the understanding that now they want to work with more value aligned kind of projects, more value aligned clientele. And especially when it comes to the service industry with something like video, it's very important for somebody to understand the messaging that you want to bring across. And we've realized that in this time of COVID, all of our clients, just like us, of course, have gone through a deep period of self-reflection and understanding where the company is moving forward. And this has really pushed um, a lot of people to understand that they need to create more video material for their companies to, to you know, promote the work that they're doing. And so it's actually been great for us. The one downside of working in a rural area, though, is that since our pandemic hit, we have been unable to meet in the physical spaces to reach out to our beneficiaries which are students here. Um, and because this is a rather poverty-stricken area, I mean, the average income in this city is $100 a month, right? So our students, they don't have the means to have their own computer that will run software that they can learn, right? So, so this was really a block. And now we're trying to think of more mobile models of access to hardware in order to learn creative skills. But, you know, it kind of articulate the whole pandemic articulated the fact that, you know, maybe in a social business clientele can actually grow while at the same time, something else is really suffering very significantly, but again, adapt, adapt, adapt. Right. It does. Uh, it, it definitely does create um, exclusion and, and can widen uh, some, some access gaps for sure. Um, so uh, we do have a, a num another member that just joined. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if I'm saying this correctly. So, you know, chalk it up to me being American if I don't, but uh, is it Evgenia? Evgenia, yeah. if it's easier to you, Eugenia. <laughs> it's a classical Greek. Okay. Eugenia, you can also say this. Okay, great. So um, the the audio is coming in a little bit of an echo there too. I don't know if you have a if you have uh, headphones that that might help a little bit. But do you want to uh, do you want to introduce yourself really quick? Uh, my name is Evgenia Shabes. I'm the founder and CEO of the consulting company Sherpa S Pro. I am also a co-founder of the International Workshop Innovation and Clusters in Brazil. Uh, and I was the federal expert of Russian Federation on the cluster development. Currently, I'm working with um, uh, clusters and helping of Tomsk. Uh, this is Siberia. Uh, Kazan, which is Tatarstan. Uh, also, there were Moscow, St. Pete, uh, and some other cities of Russia, as well as Brazil and Italy. In Brazil, it was um, Minas Gerais, and the states of Minas Gerais, São Paulo, and Rio de Janeiro. Great. Okay. I was born in Rio, actually. I was, we were oh. talking with Manfred before as well. So, incredibly international panel we have here today. So um, just to pick up on, on where we left off there. So, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts, Christian, you know, coming from uh, it's 
I, I don't know. In, in in Germany, would you consider Heidelberg a, a small city or it's a medium sized city? I would imagine. It's a very small city. It's hundred and eighty thousand uh, inhabitants, and forty thousand of them are students. Uh, so it's a very university type of uh, small city. Um, but what's very important in, in such a small place is that you create very high local density and very high local diversity of talent from all around the world, because that's that's the driver of innovation. And uh, and this is what we do with our with our local model in, in Heidelberg. I 100% agree, even though my current president may may think the opposite. Um, so the uh, in that respect, right? I know that as part of uh, some of the the biomed stuff that you're doing there, you're you're importing a lot of talent to to this region, uh, to Heidelberg, around the which you just told me it was the oldest university there, which is interesting. Um, you know, ha- has the approach changed at all with uh, you know with COVID um, in in terms of of the thinking of the importance of, of having those people physically there to create those connections and, and the information sharing? Yeah, very good question. From, you know, I told you my background is biology, virology and so on. Um, and in my view, humans are social animals and we're not going to change that in a couple of decades. Uh, and I think we all need, we all need and cherish social interactions and contacts. And I think this uh, will stay important as well. Of course, there's a lot of additional opportunities uh, due to the global reach of, of digital media and, and video conferencing systems. But technically, the best, the closest relationships, interpersonal relationships and, and networks of trust are built uh, in a bar when we sit together and drink together or eat together and discuss very personal things, which you usually, you know, you, this type of connection is not possible over, over video conference. And um, what concerns me most is that uh, our generation has had the time where we built those connections, those interpersonal relationships. But the younger generation, I look at my kids uh, and, and guessing that uh, the social distancing will stay with us for, for many years from now. Uh, it's very hard to imagine how they will cre- create their networks of trust, which will be very important for them to create impact for society. And uh, and this is uh, this is something which I think is very concerning, and this is why we need to work very hard on um, on eliminating the need uh, to socially distance, be it a vaccine or be it uh, an IT system which uh, makes sure everybody we are meeting is negative. Right? I mean, there's many ways of doing this, but I think with us, the the, the basic principle that innovation happens uh, in a in a an area where you have very local, very high local density and very lo- uh, high local diversity of talent physically present over a beer. Uh, I think this is not going to change. Okay, it's an interesting. Well, so let, let's dive into that a little bit. And, and uh, Pina, I'd love to go to you just because you're patiently waiting, and, and it's five o'clock in the morning there. Um, you know what? Have, what have you seen uh, in in Japan in general? And to, to Christian's point. Uh, do you see it as a as a risk, you know, not not just to the people that are currently in these these clusters and these innovation clusters, but also to to the newcomers, right? To the to the next generation um, that that maybe aren't creating these networks of trust that that will be essential to us creating the, the next big wave of, of technologies. I uh, yeah I can't I can't hear you I don't think we can hear you Pina. We heard you before. Okay, let me let me Pina while you figure that out. This is why I always now even though it's so so low tech I always have the the headphones in for whatever reason whether it was the Google Buds or the AirPods it's just for for webinars for me it always went in and out but um. Uh, what, uh, does anyone else have, have thoughts on this in terms of, you know, just basically, I I think it's a really interesting concept that Kristen brought up, right? It's, it's the next generation because in, in innovation, you're always looking towards the next thing. You're always trying to grow the pie, right? And if we're not including, um, not that we're not including, but if, if the, the next people coming into these clusters don't have these strong relationships built to, to, to really create these kinds of information and sharing. And, and obviously if we all grow up in a digital world, you lose a lot of the diversity, right? And it's not just diversity of, 
who we are, where we come from, diversity of ideas and all these things that, that, that really kind of can create these, these awesome innovations. Um, what does everyone else think? Eugenia, do, do you have uh, do you have any thoughts on this? I know just because and I, I'm singling you out not only because you just joined, but also because uh, it seems like you've operated in, in a lot of different cultures and and clusters. One thing I didn't mention introducing myself: I am a founder of uh, and coordinator of the research center Rue Generations, devoted to uh, this is uh, the Russian school of generation theory, and that's exactly. Uh, I, I, I thought I would skip this because that's usually what people want me to talk about, especially now. Uh, but here there are two things about younger generations. Currently, we have a millennial generation. Uh, and it's uh, more uh, accurate to call them millennium because they were born in the last century and they uh, graduated from school in the new, uh, say, not just century, uh, new millennial. So new millennium, they crossed this border. So millennial means everyone being born during 1,000 years or 999 years. So with this generation, uh, they are currently uh, doing PhDs. Uh, they are currently going into startups quite a lot. And um, uh, they are those who are still in uh, senior, uh, uh, I would say, years of the university. Generation Z or homelanders born after 2003, and that's only when they were born, not earlier. They are still kids, so we are going to see them. The main difference between those two generations is that uh, from the point of view of communication, it's much easier to enter the mass or the global mass of millennium generation. Concerning generation Z, uh, Z or Zoom generation or homelanders, which is a more correct name for them, it's quite difficult because they're a niche generation. And that's the reality we are having now because uh, they are so specialized. Actually, from them, we expect to see lots of scientists uh, lots of people go in there and we expect something like the blossom of this area because they had the task uh, that uh, they had goals quite articulated globally that it's good to be a scientist uh, because money go there. It's good to work with technologies because money go there and there are lots of success, uh, success stories. And it's good to do everything when you're going deeper. We also got extra that it's good to be a doctor for the last uh, two and a half years. But after COVID, it's definitely like a must now. I don't know about other countries. In Russia, uh, we had uh, the highest uh, comp uh, uh, comp uh, competition rate for the budget level in St. Petersburg Medical Acad Academy. 400 people. 400 for a place. Imagine, they never had this competition just to enter. But those young guys, they heard about this. Uh, so they will be going into clusters and they're interested in it. So we just need to articulate much better for them that there is a place. Plus, uh, globally, we need to articulate uh, much better that there is a place both for the boys and for the girls. And uh, I would say, uh, probably in Armenia, you also had something like this. There was a long period when there was no, we didn't have STEM problem like the United States for a long time. Now we have it. Uh, unfortunately, I have to accept because uh, from our research, we hear from girls when they are asking whether we can be successful in technical sciences and go into those places. And recently, uh, the, near Kazan, there is uh, the Inapolis cluster. So that's more with IT accent. And we were speaking as uh, at the expert club together with the rector of it. And he asked me, so can you do anything about attracting more girls? And usually it was like uh, the challenge, I would say, for the class, uh, like for the uh, areas where there were not uh, IT people in Russia, there were lots of girls always. But now we are also having this challenge. And I would say that this is something uh, which doesn't depend on the pandemic, but we need to have those people. We need to show the diversity and they are ready to hear the question of the diversity. This is number one. And number two, uh, there is a um, very big expectation on uh, combination of various sciences. 
So actually, I think what we are not ready for, and uh, that doesn't touch just the clusters, it touches the whole communities, because uh, those uh, young kids who were born after 20, uh, 2003, Generation Z, or homelanders, they will be the generation which will build uh, chaotically new sciences and new things, uh, not just for the startups, but on a larger scale. So, and we are not ready because we can't predict what will be there. It will be a combination like opera and cyber gaming. It could be IT yeah. plus uh, anything. And so this is something we need to consider with the clusters now. Uh, who will be able uh, to, whom do we need there? And uh, who will be able also to teach and increase the qualities, the knowledge, the skills, and what actually we need for those crazy combinations. And when I mentioned opera and cyber gamings, I was telling about the concrete case. So you never know. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, um, and Pina, do, can you, can you uh, hear us? And... Yeah. Can you hear me? I can, yeah, we can. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, sorry for the audio problem. Yeah, yeah, no, so, no, no yeah. problem. It's yeah, a new platform so, for a lot of us. <laughs> yeah. So first, uh, I'd like to a little bit explain about the situation in Tokyo uh, of the COVID. And then um, the infection is relatively low comparing to other uh, countries like U.S. or European countries. And But uh, we also have uh, some restrictions for the uh, events and the parties having in clusters, but uh, we can form small group meetings such as the meetups. So the communities uh, are continuing the meetups uh, in small size, while uh, the most of the activities, large activities, move on to online. So that is a situation of uh, innovation, innovative innovation class in Tokyo. So talking about the young people, um, yes, uh, as, as, uh, they, they told before, uh, it is difficult to have a good relationship or trustship for newcomers. So for our age or the more younger, uh, the experience group, uh, they have, they already have that trust and the relationship uh, among the community. But for the younger generation, for instance, uh, the, in, in Tokyo, the, the April is a new fiscal year for the, uh, the graduates. So the April, as you know, was a center of pandemic. So the new graduate uh, this year have having a real, really a trouble of having relationship and trustship in the community. So uh, the that is a real problem, and uh, I think that will continue not only this year, but the the situation, the restricted situation continues even in Tokyo. So we need to find some way to make a, a relationship for the newcomers. We um, the experienced people, veterans are fine, but uh, for the new people, I think uh, we are struggling to have a. Um, make some uh, new scheme or yeah. more situations. I think I think it's important it too. And and just so I think, um, you know, I, I want to transition the conversation a little bit now, right? We've been talking about okay, like yes, that this this year has been interesting to say the least, right? And we're all we're all going into sort of a new reality. At least for us at Founder Institute, we look at this. We, we've always been trying to look at this, you know, we're, we're entrepreneurs, right? So we, we take a very positive look and it's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity to either expand geographic reach, to bring in new people, new ideas, um, whether, you know, we talked about diversity and it could be, you know, uh, whether it's women or other types of diversity, but even for us, like I, we see even just geographic, sociopolitical diversity is like massive, right? And that kind of stuff wasn't able to happen before. Like, you know, us, us are, we're based in Palo Alto. We would have a hard time getting people from 50 miles away because of the traffic out here to come to our programs in San Francisco, right? Now our recent Silicon Valley program, because of the time zone makes sense, uh, about a third of it uh, was from Australia, right? Because we run our programs at night 
and they're able to join in, in the morning or mid afternoon, I think is, is what it ends up coming out to over there. Right. So th- these kinds of opportunities, I, I think is, is a, is a huge thing. And, and um, I just, I'd like to hear what, what other people think in, in their communities where, where they have seen this, you know, what could be seen as a negative, but really turned it into a positive and, and how people are embracing this um, because we, we are going to go back to some in-person stuff and, and a lot of us here already are, but, but this, this virtual thing is here to stay and it's been accelerated so much where I, I, at least in my opinion, I think it'd be remiss for us to not bake it into, into our, you know, in, into the opportunities for all of our organizations to grow. Right. Does somebody want to jump in on that? Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you. So Evgenia, I am Brazilian. I come from Brazil, <laughs> from South Brazil. Uh, muito prazer. And uh, immigrant in Canada. Yes, thank you for your input. I uh, value a lot uh, what you have said. And what I would like to say just uh, on this last point and then coming back to Christian said, um, we have established extension, uh, outreach to community from the university, um, extension culture. What happens is that the online courses that are being offered, even in conjunction with universities in Calgary or here, for instance, Calgary, it's about uh, many, many subjects uh, here in, in uh, Edmonton about cannabis research and so forth. It's it's for, uh, it's boosting the numbers of attendees. Then they not, don't need to travel. They don't need to park. They just take part of that. So it is it is. Uh, uh, I hope that when we come back, uh, the world opens here, that we will uh, keep the positive aspects of what the pandemic has accelerated uh, in, in us uh, creating a, a new way of interacting. But the personal aspect is important too. So, for instance, I have my staff, I see them on the full staff uh, every week. Uh, one week is the full meeting, the, the, uh, the other week is the virtual happy hour with a little glass or whatever I drink. Yeah? Uh, we had already also an in-person drink with the proper distancing, everything went, went well, but this is needed, this trust. Now, here as we speak, I have one of my staff uh, representing me at the meeting that is happening right now in Edmonton. Uh, on, a, on a hub on cluster on AI. So what's happening? Concordia joined with three other post-secondaries in Alberta, it's Edmonton and Calgary, with Amy, Alberta Machine in, uh, Intelligence Institute, uh, a hub with federal grants, large federal grant, to create micro-credentials and a pathway from junior high to, to PhD. This is, is being worked as we speak. We haven't yet announced it uh, very uh, loudly yet. Uh, it will be coming, I think, uh, possibly before Christmas. But uh, here you have the new generation being able to engage in a pathway of AI and what this can bring in, in terms of uh, interactions. Um, so, so it's important to have the points like partners, but more important to have the lines between the partners, right? Uh, the lines between the partners, the connections are, are what is important in the, in the web. This, the pandemic is, um, uh, I mean, boosting. Uh, and that's why I want to say that um, to the point of Zvigenia and uh, Zvigenia, is, sorry, um, get your name right. Um, Evgenia, Evgenia, yes, and Christian. So, yeah, does anyone else have, have, have thoughts on this? I mean, I think it's... Um... Yeah, the, the connections are always the most important thing, right? So it, it doesn't have to be a physical space. And believe me, I, I've seen a lot of places around the world, right, that build some huge, shiny building with ball pits and slides and, you, you know, all of this typical innovation stuff, right? But it, it's really all about the connections. So do, do other people think that those are... You know, what are you seeing in your communities? Do, do you see those being degraded? Yeah. Christian? My opinion is a little different. So um, if we look at opportunities to meet in conferences like this, uh, when there were in-person conferences, uh, you had to choose very well. You could not fly to three different places at the same time. Um, and, and now there is, with still the same, let's say, attention span and the number of people participating in conferences, the offering has uh, uh, has exploded basically. So you can you can go to 500 conferences every day, and this is what what happens in the financial markets in such a situation is called inflation. So what's happening at the moment is um, an, an inflation of of perception 
of a quality of an online course and and, and the result being uh, a fatigue of participating in such in such conferences you know just just, just taking the Horace's uh, uh, conference uh, in the last couple of years beautiful places you eat and drink with a lot of people you speak in a room of you know hundreds of highly uh, highly interesting people and at the moment we're online two people watching uh, it's it's this fatigue that is coming up with this uh, uh, enormous offering of, of video conferences and, and, and digital digital uh, content and this is why I think um, it's it's not sustainable it's on theory it's democratizing innovation it's allowing everyone to participate in everything but the the cumulative number of attention span has not increased with the number with the amount of content right and this means that must is some sort of inflation and quality becomes more important. And quality is also interpersonal relationships. That makes sense. Yeah. Go, go ahead, please. Uh, I uh, so in Russia we are quite lucky. So, wow! Can you hear me? Ah, sorry, it's uh, Alisa, uh, AI of the Russian Google uh, of the Russian Yandex. Uh, sorry to say this. Uh, I'm trying to switch it off, but uh, it's uh, going to talk with us a bit. Uh, so uh, we don't have this quarantine. Oh, come on, uh, Lisa, switch off. Uh, uh, we are not in a very strict quarantine regime uh, here in Russia. Last week I was at the first big conference, 3,000 people, uh, so alive. Uh, like in the uh, former times, uh, and it was, uh, I would say, very strange. Uh, and I also started teaching, and it's also alive. And I can say in the university, and I can say I'm a guest professor there, that at the conference, uh, and it was for the innovations, a lot on AI and a lot on digital, people got crazy. So I would say we were sitting, not everyone was even wearing a mask. Uh, because uh, the people, it was uh, for sure you were sitting so close, sometimes you wanted to talk, even though when you mentioned drinking and social distancing, it didn't work. You wanted to kiss and people were saying, okay, come on, and uh, we were kissing. Uh, no, we were kissing like normal people on the cheek. And I would say that uh, because we were talking, and I would say what I see in Russia now, hopefully we would have also open innovations in three weeks, on the 19th of uh, October, but uh, it's a huge rush because now they, for example, announced in Moscow uh, the uh, school holidays starting urgently from 5th of October because we have autumn and we don't have that much of uh, maybe COVID, but we also have a flu and we got accustomed to passing this test. It's free of charge in Russia. Uh, in not everywhere, but in many places, and we are uh, making those tests on antibodies. So, for example, if you know that you have antib high antibodies, you feel safer. Uh, that uh, it's a tradition. For example, our like government structures or people working in uh, state organizations, they pass this ever before every big meeting, uh, even for thirty people uh, for thirty people together. So it's like an everyday procedure now. So you are not even afraid of all this. But people wanted uh, to do want to do now everything like in a rush, as if no one knows what's going to happen afterwards. Uh, are we going to be closed? And we were not. Uh, only Moscow was strictly closed for a long time. Like the rest of Russia was opened on the twelfth of May. So we didn't have a long quarantine. Right. And uh, I, but I would say now what we are discussing, everyone, like we are so crazily busy with our job, everyone. And I would say the reason is uh, not traditional uh, September because we have also the rise of activities during this period. The reason is unpredictability because no one is uh, uh, knows exactly what's going to happen. So you are trying to push in everything into a very short period of time. Economically, it is good because everyone is crazy. Uh, I would say from the point of collaborations, it's also good because everyone is crazy. It's like, you know, catching up the uh, window of opportunities. But it's like a short term, it's not long term planning for all those projects. But frankly speaking, 
I would say that uh, we saw some examples of big collaboration among innovat innovators now. For sure in uh, medicine, like with our vaccine, which was announced that we have it, uh, and still we, and we started having vaccination for the volunteers with uh, AI, a lot with digital and with digital uh, education because uh, we found out that we have very good uh, quality of this in Russia. Um, so that's it. Okay. And we're coming up on the end here. So I just want to, um, you know, it's an interesting, so clearly Christian's made his voice known here, right? He's like, you need to be, you need to make these personal connections, right? You gotta, you gotta have a beer or whatever, you know, the, it's a metaphor, right? Just whatever it is that the personal connections here, um, you know, do, do other, I mean, at least, so my opinion on that, I think he's right. I also think just FYI founder Institute, what we've seen is that if you can do virtual programs and stuff, if there is some physical component, because if you have a, uh, some kind of physical socialization, Right. And we got we saw this by accident because all of a sudden COVID happened and we had programs that were maybe one or two weeks in. So the people had already done physical bonding and then it went virtual and those were strong. Right. So it's sort of a, a little bit of a mix. And I think you could determine, OK, whether it needs to be on the front end or or whatever. But um, does anyone else, you know, have, have thoughts on on that? Like. And I think we, yeah, we have two minutes and 30 seconds. So, tr so try to keep it short. Um, do you want to, I haven't heard from you uh, in, in a minute, uh, Sashka, do, what are your thoughts on it? I just want to quickly share an experience that I had about a week ago. Um, there was an online conference called Civil Match that was, <clears throat> excuse me, looking to connect Caucasian countries with European partners. And it was a speed networking thing. And when I signed up for it, I really didn't have high hopes for the program. But in the speed networking, I ran into a German partner who I had met by chance a year before for five minutes. He ended up connecting us with a German partner and with a partner from Azerbaijan. And now we're working on a project that's going to be a mobile truck with all the hardware needed to learn creative skills traveling through all three regions. And so this is a collaboration that never would have come up had it not been for COVID and a platform that was trying to connect us for exactly this reason. But... On the contrary, we have already in our discussions, you know, realized the difficulty of being so distant because the project is so large and intense. You need to have that team bonding, which is very difficult to do when you're all in six different time zones. I'm sure you've heard in the news that war between Armenia and Azerbaijan has just broken out. And so that's a big factor that we have to, you know, think about moving forward. And so there are all these moving parts that Yes, a new opportunity has arisen, but I don't think that that means that we should accept, you know, the positive of the extra connection that we're having now as the norm, right? Because there's no way that we're going to be able to create extra clusters in rural areas, decentralize more and more, unless the physical connection is there. But now, of course, the virtual world is completely catered and woven into that. So I think moving forward, the balance is, is, is going to be the, the, the name of the game, basically. Okay. Interesting. Does anyone else have uh, have any final thoughts to throw in here? Yeah, one thing, and uh, I'd like to add uh, one positive side. Uh, uh, there's uh, many many changes because of the COVID. Uh, the that changes still make many challenges, and uh, I believe will generate many innovations that I help. So there's uh, many concerns and issues, but uh, not only the negative side. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I, I enjoyed hearing the global perspectives. I really did. So, um, yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, I'm not sure if it's going to hang up on you now like it does on Zoom immediately, but uh, but it was nice to meet you all. And thanks, anyone, who, for tuned in. Bye. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Sayonara. Bye. Boa noite. Boa tarde. Ciao, ciao. Счастливо, до свидания.